question is, how do you get from cybernetics to the notion of machine intelligence and the specific notion of artificial intelligence? And this is a very wonderful story. It's a very important story, in my view, for this century. You know a little bit about what cybernetics means. Actually, you have a lot of knowledge of cybernetics now. Let me define AI, though, in a very narrow way for the purposes of this discussion. By artificial intelligence, I mean the attempt to create human-like intelligence with digital computers that we have today. Now, that may seem like a restrictive definition, but I've got to tell you, all of the literature of the 50s and 60s and 70s and maybe even into the 80s says, oh yeah, we can make computers intelligent like people, no problem. And what I want to do in the remainder of the class today is tell you why that isn't as stupid as it sounds as a claim. And I got to tell you, when I first came across that, I thought, digital computers people, digital computers people, really? Are you really going to make a digital computer as smart as a person? I doubt it. But here's why it made a certain amount of sense. And it starts back with cybernetics and with this guy, McCullough. The <coughs> CH is silent. So Warren McCullough and Walter Pitts are there. And they're saying, you know, gee, we got this thing called the brain. And it's got these nerve cells in it. And there's something going on with this electrical activity. And that's all too complicated. I can't really figure out what's going on there. But let's abstract it out. Let's keep it simple. Let's imagine that there's a neuron which has a threshold, and it's got just a couple of connections. I mean, real neurons have thousands of connections coming into them in the brain, right? Let's just take a few connections. And let's say that if the threshold is 2, and I got a, a pulse coming in here, that's a 1, and a 1 coming in here, it doesn't matter what's coming in here, then I'll get a 1 coming out of that. So it's a threshold neuron. And if I have enough inputs, I get an output, otherwise I don't. And they said, you know, neurons are really much hairier than that, but this is interesting. Let's think about this in the abstract, and let's see where we go. So let's take these things, and let's plug them together into neural nets, and let's figure out that for a given input, what kind of output, what kind of processing this thing will do. Great question. Terrific question. But then the problem comes, well, gee, what kind of computation can that do? Is there any comparison we can make? to a formalism in mathematics. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that's what we need. We got this thing. We've never thought of it before. Nobody's thought of it before. This is a simplified version of what a brain does. How can we characterize what this can do? And they looked around. They didn't have to look far. And they came across Alan Turing and the notion of Turing computability. What does Turing computability mean? Well, Alan Turing, before computers existed, was trying to solve various problems. I won't go into detail. But basically, he said, let's imagine that I could describe a problem. And that description had two elements to it. It had a description of a program. He didn't call it a program. And a description of the data that you give to the program. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. So let's imagine if there was a machine, and I gave it a description of the program I wanted it to perform and a description of the data that I wanted it to perform. And this universal Turing machine would compute it. That's really cool. Now remember, Turing thought of this before computers existed. I have to say that again. But he thought in the abstract, hey, wait a minute. I could build an adding machine, and all it does is add numbers. Or I can build a dividing machine, and all it does is do division. Or I can build a description of the calculation and the data set that I want it to compute over, 27, 36, 95. And I feed this description of the machine that I want to have built, but I haven't built, and a description of the data that I want it to compute. And I give it to this universal machine. And the universal machine says, ah, if I were this specific machine, what I would do now with these two numbers is I would add them, and here's the answer. This was an imaginary thing. Now you're skipping ahead, but that's okay. So 
What McCullough and Pitts did in the 40s was they looked around, and there was this thing called Turing computability, which had this amazing feature, which was that anything you could describe as data and program could be computed by this universal machine. And what McCullough and Pitts did was they showed that the universal Turing machine and their threshold neurons were completely equivalent in what they could compute. So anything that a Turing, a Turing machine could compute, their neural nets could compute and vice versa. Now how they did this was magic. It was mathematics. You don't care. But believe that any really smart guy who is a mathematician who looks at this stuff would say, yes, I believe you. You have proven that your threshold neurons and Turing computability were completely equivalent. Okay so far? Wonderful. Now here's where we get into trouble. Other people come along and they say, well, wait a minute. Hold it a second. This digital computer sitting in front of me, <coughs> we're in the 50s now, what is that? It's a general purpose machine that takes the data, 27, 39, 86, and a description of the process I want it to execute, program, software, and with this magic universal machine, this general computer, it takes data in a program and it computes whatever it wants to compute. So, okay, so if a digital computer is a universal Turing machine, and a universal Turing machine can compute everything that neurons can compute, and back here neurons, I, threshold neurons, the specific model, threshold neurons are what brains have, AI was born, by one version of the story, with this commutative process, we said last week that commutivity doesn't always exist. In their minds, brains were computers. Or computers could be made smart like brains. Now in retrospect, it's kind of easy to look at this and to see where they got to. But this was really what was going on. This was the birth of AI. This was AI coming out of cybernetics. Cybernetics starts with all this purpose stuff and this, you know, view of how do we think and how we understand things and it's about epistemology and it's about other things and then it's a couple of guys up here looking at, you know, functions here and they happen to be working in cybernetics and then turning computability and the equivalents and brains are digital computers. Digital computers can be made into brains. It's the birth of AI. 